Many people around the world associate September 11th with the terror attacks on New York's Twin Towers back in 2001. But before that, September 11th, 1973 marked a different, rather ominous day, the beginning of the Pinochet military dictatorship in Chile. At the height of the Cold War, Salvador Allende, Chile's first democratically elected president, came to power, only to be deposed in a military coup after three years in office. Now, General Augusto Pinochet pledged to restore order amid a spiraling economic crisis, but his regime also brought brutal repression. Tens of thousands of people were tortured, executed, and forcibly disappeared during his 17 years in power. A half a century later, there are around 1,300 active criminal cases for human rights violations during his dictatorship. And the United States still hasn't declassified documents relating to its role in the coup d'etat. I hope that, in the long run, when the debris and controversies pass, I hope that two things remain. One, the declaration of the four living former presidents committing us to the care and respect for democracy and the unrestricted appreciation of the human rights of looking to the future, regardless of the differences we may have had in the past. Well, that was Gabriel Boric, who came to power last year following massive protests over inequality. Now, the leftist leader is facing an economic slowdown and split legislature. It's against this backdrop that, according to polling, Chileans appear to be losing faith in democracy and even reappraising Pinochet's complicated legacy. To me, everyone is a communist, but we had 17 years of glory, and my general Pinochet represents freedom, represents heroism. And we, in these days, we the women, keep on fighting so this communism does not enter our motherland. So on the 50th anniversary of Chile's military coup, has the country fully healed? And what is the legacy of General Augusto Pinochet, the controversial so-called Chicago Boys economic policies that he implemented, and the constitution his regime left behind? Well, joining me now to debate that are from Stockholm, Sergio Bitar. He is a former detainee of Augusto Pinochet's regime and former minister of state for Chile. In Paris, Fernando Ayala, a former Chilean ambassador and former official of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And from Milan, Luigi Zengales, an economist at the Chicago Booth School of Business and co-host of the podcast, Capital Isn't. Thanks all so much for being with me. Uh, Sergio, I'll begin with you and uh, bring us as best you can what you remember about this day 50 years ago. Were you at all prepared for what would transpire and the fact that the military would actually detain you as well? There were many rumors, and of course you were listening, but you are never prepared to such brutality, to the breaking of the system of democracy, killing the president, bombarding the government palace, killing people, torturing people, uh, banning parties, closing Congress, banning trade unions, expelling people, arresting. Well, no, you are not prepared for Okay. We'll, we'll rejoin Sergio. We'll get that connection reestablished. But let me move on, move on to uh, Fernando and ask if, um, were you happy, actually, at the time uh, with the performance of Salvador Allende? Um, he had been losing the support of his coalition. The economy was not performing well. Was a demand for change justified, even if not as extreme as a military coup? And even then, why not wait for the next election? I can tell you that I was uh, in my first year at the university in 1973. I was supporting the government of President Allende as millions of young people. And of course, nobody denied then and today that we were facing a very serious crisis, economic, and social and political crisis. But nobody expected that the militaries who has promise to obey constitution, they broke democracy because Chile was a full democracy until September 11th, 1973. You can check newspapers, whatever. Nobody can say that Chile was not living in a full democracy until that year. So everybody knew that was a crisis in the, in the air 
but the brutality that we face because from the first day the first day the the hunters the uh, airplanes war airplanes they bombed the not only the the palace of the government but the private residence of the president where, where was his uh, wife and the first from the first day people start to be shooting without any kind of uh, of, of uh, judgment or whatever right the, from the first day people was disappear and torture so until today after 50 year we are still looking for the bodies of more than 1000 people and who killed them we know was the army the militaries mm. they made them disappear so what we can do right and i know it's still so tragic today but as we know there are many chileans who who celebrated this takeover uh, let me turn to yes. luigi because in in the wake of the takeover we had of course pinochet's use of the neoliberal, some say experimental, economic policies of the Chicago boys to turn the economy around. In hindsight, I mean, should they have been applied in the context of Chile, Chile at the time? Uh, even as desperate as, as the economic situation may have been, there was already massive inequality issues at play. Did it make sense to institute such policies? First of all, I would like to separate uh, the tragedy of the coup from the economic issues. In a sense, I, I empathize uh, greatly with the two people who spoke uh, before me because uh, it's true that uh, Chile was a democracy and was turned into a brutal dictatorship. So I don't think that any economic agenda can justify what happened. Uh, now, given this, um, were the policy applied uh, good for what happened uh, or for the situation at the time in Chile. And I think it's a mixed bag in a sense. I think that uh, when it comes to microeconomics, uh, the uh, students from the University of Chicago, so-called as Chicago boys, applied um, uh, some policies that were in line with the Chicago tradition, which was, for example, to open uh, markets uh, to foreign competition, which I think was a good idea, uh, but they also, uh, peg uh, the peso to to the dollar, creating a crisis in 1982 that caused uh, the failure of the major banks and mm. uh, a lot of unemployment. So I think that uh, from a macro point of view, their record was very mixed. I think that from a microeconomic point of view, I think that they change uh, a bit the mentality of the government in Chile. At the time of Allende, everything was under price control. Even before Allende, Chile was very much a protected economy where everything was decided at the administrative level and now is a market economy with, uh, I think, a lot of uh, uh, dysfunctions. And I'm the first one, if you want, to tell you later what the dysfunctions are, mm. but also uh, it started a process of growth okay. that uh, really brought uh, a lot of people out of poverty. Yeah, well, that's that. And I mean, Sergio, I'll turn to you because uh, we've heard that before, that a lot of people were brought out of poverty, but then some say in the longer term, it just massively increased inequality in, uh, in Chile. But these at the time were economists that were led by a Nobel, Nobel Prize winning economist uh, in uh, Milton Friedman, while others were arguing that this was a complete misfit for a developing economy like Chile. What did you see? develop economically, Sergio? I agree with my uh, the colleague that spoke before that you cannot put together the brutality of the coup, the violations of human rights, and then discuss if the, you have to peg the dollar, the pay, what's the, the level of fiscal deficit. <laughs> so, but at the same time, I can say the following. I recognize that the, there were mistakes in the economic policy of the popular unity. The aim was to distribute the power, economic power. It was such level of poverty impressive at the time. But nothing can justify an economic policy for a coup to take place as it took place. Mm. That's one point. Second, so you have to condemn that. 
So economic policies, social policies, public policies, you solve them through the democracy. Then, after the coup, the military, a very brutal opening of the economy, control of, of, of the fiscal deficit, and they provoked major unemployment and poverty. So the question there is, would you do that without a dictatorship? Mm. How do you do that? In the okay. So I think you have to. But you cannot justify what was done in economics without considering that you couldn't do it in a democracy. You had to, to press right. the Understood. people. That I'll tell you what, we're down, unfortunately, to our last few minutes. Uh, Fernando, I'll ask you today how well uh, has or is reconciliation actually going in Chile? Because you still have many who do believe that Pinochet was somehow a savior for the country. Uh, you still hear people today speaking about how the military stopped Chile from becoming another Cuba, and that it's you know, still one of the strongest and most stable economies in Latin America. Do you think that's fair? I think that is part, partially true. Because in 1973, the country was divided. 50% of the population was supporting Allende and 50% was against the, uh, the government. That doesn't mean that people want a military coup with that brutality that happened. But before that, I, I, if somebody can be blamed, it's not the University of Chicago. It's a group of Chilean economists that were following Milton Friedman theories. And the opportunity for Mr. Friedman was to have a big lab, because Chile was a kind of laboratory. Anywhere happened what was made in Chile with the reform. The, the, at the same time that they were killing people, they imposed reform to privatize the big industry, to privatize the, uh, the public companies, to do a lot of things, to manipulate dollars, whatever. We didn't have a, 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 an independent central bank at that time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Having said that, I will add that today Chile is not reconciliated. Why? Mm -hmm. Because in my personal opinion, the main responsible for that, what happened in Chile was the armed forces. The same day they appear on the TV, the four generals from the Army, Navy, Air Force, and the police to justify the coup. We had to wait 30 years, 30 years, that the first, first time the chief of the army say that will never happen again. I, they gave okay. some sharp justification. After 20 years, last year was the second time where the um, um, army, uh, the chief of the army, say that was responsibility of Augusto Pinochet. But what we need to reconciliate the country is that all institutions that made the coup, that means the armed forces together, and the same way as they okay. did it in 2011, they have to give give yeah. an explanation to the people. Fernando, I'm so sorry. We're going to have to interrupt it there because we are completely out of time for this segment of the Newsmakers. But I'd like to thank sincerely all three of my panelists for being with us. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, and our viewers, of course, for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on X and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.